Millions of Americans are reportedly having their phone records seized without their knowledge. The Washington Post and The Guardian reporting the U.S. government is now also tapping directly into the central servers of nine leading Internet companies, including Microsoft, Yahoo, Google, Facebook, AOL, Skype, YouTube, and Apple. This administration also puts forward a false choice between the liberties we cherish and the security we provide. I will provide our intelligence and law enforcement agencies with the tools they need to track and take out the terrorists without undermining our Constitution and our freedom. The NSA specifically targets the communications of everyone. It ingests them by default. It collects them in its system and it filters them and it analyzes them and it measures them and it stores them. Any analyst at any time can target anyone, uh, any selector anywhere. Where those uh, communications will be picked up depends on the range of the sensor networks and the authorities that that analyst is uh, empowered with. But I, sitting at my desk, uh, certainly had the authorities to, to wiretap anyone, from you or your accountant to a federal judge to even the president if I had a personal email. What's up, it's C. Wade here. I hope you're doing well. I'm about to walk you through a few steps in this video to further safeguard yourself from unwarranted surveillance. There are many arguments regarding the subject at hand, but from a strict security point of view, it is more than fair to not want your communications wiretapped. While there is no such thing as 100% security as Obama suggested, there are better practices that can be applied in an ethical manner to better protect the privacy and integrity of our contents. I won't be able to show you everything in this video, but I will be able to offer a few ways to get started and provide some extended resources for further investigation. To start, I'm going to show you how to encrypt your hard drive. I'm not going to get into the finer details of cryptography, which I plan to do in a later series, but can rather summarize it by saying that it denies unauthorized individuals from being able to access the plain text information. It was ruled in the United States v. Doe case that it is unconstitutional to force someone to decrypt information that could expose self-incriminating files. A lot of law-abiding citizens and computer users could benefit from encrypting their information for a multitude of reasons, but I'll save my personal opinions for another video. If you're in Windows or Mac, you will want to use TrueCrypt. If you're in Linux, you may consider EcryptFS, but you can also get TrueCrypt. We'll begin by opening up a web browser, going up to the address bar, and typing in truecrypt.org. We'll head on over to the downloads page and download the installation package that is relevant to the operating system we are in. In this case, I'm in Windows 7, but if there's enough requests for me to make another video for a specific operating system, I'd be happy to do so. We'll hit download, save file, we'll open that up, I accept the license terms, next, next, I would recommend that you leave create system restore point checked as I believe TrueCrypt signed the driver. I've already installed TrueCrypt so I unticked it. We'll hit install. Okay, TrueCrypt is installed. We will now open it up. And what I recommend that you do is encrypt your entire hard drive. And to do this you would go up to system, encrypt system partition slash drive. Hit next and the option is right here, encrypt the whole drive. And with that, you wouldn't even be able to boot into the operating system without first specifying the correct key. What we're going to do is create an encrypted file container where we can get into the operating system first without specifying a key, and the attacker may be able to access other information and use tools relevant to the operating system, but they will not be able to view my sensitive information or the files that I want to protect without first decrypting contents within, within this container. So there's a little bit of a difference. So we're going to hit create volume. We'll go ahead and select this option, create an encrypted file container and hit next. We will use the hidden true crypt volume type, the normal volume creation mode, and we will next specify our volume location. 
So I'm going to have my volume on my desktop in the directory crypt. You can save it in the root of your C drive, my documents, wherever you wish. Um, you can save this file as anything. You can save it as my name.txt, my picture.jpg, my music.mp3. You don't even need to give it a file extension, which I will do. I'm just going to name it crypt and save that. We'll hit next. And now we're going to create our outer volume. Essentially, we'll be creating two volumes. We'll be creating an outer volume and a hidden volume. And so, if somebody is ever holding a gun to your head saying, enter in the damn password, we could enter in a secondary password, if you will, and reveal sensitive looking contents of our outer volume without actually revealing the contents that we want to protect. So, we'll go ahead and create our outer volume first. We'll hit next. And let's go ahead and use the AES encryption algorithm. It's what the government, it's what the military uses to protect their sensitive material from unwanted eyes. We'll use the RIPE MD160 hash algorithm. Hit next. And I would recommend that you use a larger quantity of space for your volume size. I mean, you know what you need to use, but I don't know why you'd use 25 megabytes like I'm using for this demonstration. And now we are on to creating our outer volume password. This varies. I mean, I'd recommend definitely for your inner volume password to use the 64 character key. But for this, you may not need to. So I'll just go ahead and enter in a 9 character password right here. I'll hit next. And we're going to generate a random pool by just moving our cursor around. And then we'll hit format. Now it has mounted our outer volume, so we'll go ahead and hit this button right here, open outer volume. And what we want to do is place some sensitive looking files in here. We don't want this to be the content that we're actually trying to protect. We want this to be content that is convincing enough to the person who has the gun to our head to take them and then leave. So I have my top secret file ready to go, my long lost document. So I'll place that there. That's ready to go. That's all I really need. So we'll do that and hit next. Yes. And now we are on to creating our hidden volume, the important volume. I'm going to use Tufish for the encryption algorithm. You can use AKS if you want. It's more fast than Tufish. Um, Tufish is just as equally as strong as AES. It was a finalist, but I'll use SHA-512 for the hash algorithm. Hit next, and I'll use as much space as I can for this volume, so 24 megabytes in this instance. I'll hit yes, and this right here is where you would want to use a 64 character password. So go ahead and enter in your 64 character password right here. Hit next, move your cursor around to generate this random pool, and we will hit format. And now we are good to go, our hidden volume was successfully created. And so, as you can see, it's right here um, where I saved it in my crypt directory. Um, if we were to open that up in any sort of analyzer, you would just get a whole bunch of gibberish. What we need to do to open this up is decrypt it, essentially, with our one of our keys. So right now, I have the gun pointed at my head. So we'll select the file. Crypt. And we'll hit mount. And I have the gun pointed at my head, right? So I'm going to enter in the password that we specified for the outer volume. This was our nine character password, not our 64 character password. And when I hit OK for this, I go to my computer. Now that I go to the iDrive, you can see our long lost document, our sensitive looking type document that we specified for the outer volume. And when they open it up, oh, there's the Fifth Amendment. Yeah, the one that they violated. So that's nice. Let it be noted that after you create your outer and hidden volumes and you place files within your outer volume, you don't ever want to place any more files within your outer volume because you can, potential, you can potentially corrupt your hidden volume. And that's where your important content is going to be. So please, please, please take note of that. So we will now dismount that. The guy with the gun walked away. Now I can, in the privacy of my own home, open up the content that 
I'm actually protecting. So we will hit mount and we will enter in our 64 character password, right? Now we'll go open up the iDrive and there should be nothing in there. And so now I can go ahead, place whatever content I want in there. Dismount. Guy with the gun comes back. Did I just see you open up some moose? I know, man, look. And the long lost document's right there. Oh, okay, I must have just been seeing something, yeah. So, check out EcryptFS if you're on Linux uh, to encrypt your file system. It's another great utility. I'm gonna go now and encrypt my whole drive. I don't know about you. So, TrueCrypt, EcryptFS, encrypt your hard drive. Do it now. Judge, how would you describe this man? I would describe this man as an American hero, as a person willing uh, to risk life, limb, and, and liberty in order to expose to the American people one of the most extraordinary violations of uh, American principles, value judgments, and the Constitution itself uh, in, all, in all of our history. It's been revealed that former Russian President Dmitry Medvedev was eavesdropped on during the G20 summit in London back in 2009. Revelations from uh, NSA whistleblower Edward Snowden. He claims Britain collects, stores and shares data from monitoring global email and social networks with the uh, US security agency. The US has filed criminal charges against Edward Snowden. That's the man ex who exposed to the world uh, the extent of the secret global surveillance network run by the NSA. Reports say Washington will now attempt to extradite the 30-year-old from Hong Kong the ex-CIA employee turned whistleblower has been sheltering ever since exposing the American spy machine. He's done a great service because uh, he's, t he's telling the truth and this is what we are starved for. The American people are starved for the truth. And when you have a dictatorship or an authoritarian government, truth uh, becomes treasonous. So now that we have encrypted the contents of our hard drive, the next thing to do is encrypt the contents of our online messages. Specifically, what we would do is use GNU Privacy Guard to encrypt our email, which is an open source implementation of OpenPGP. Pretty good privacy. GNU Privacy Guard, also known as GPG for short, is a hybrid crypto system that compresses and encrypts a plain text message in ciphertext. GPG creates a one-time secret key called the session key which is then used with the recipient's public key. The recipient decrypts the ciphertext by applying their private key to recover the temporary session key, which is then used to retrieve the plain text. Imagine two people who have never met could do an amazing trick. Alice and Bob are allowed to communicate over a line which is tapped, so any message they pass will be intercepted by Eve who is always listening. The trick is to agree on a secret numerical key, without Eve also obtaining a copy. How is this possible? First, let's explore how this trick is done using colors. So how could Alice and Bob agree on a secret color without Eve finding it out? The trick is based on two facts. One, it's easy to mix two colors together to make a third color. And two, given a mixed color, it's hard to reverse it in order to find the exact original colors. This is the basis for a lock, easy in one direction, hard in the reverse direction. This is known as a one-way function. Now, the solution works as follows. First, they publicly agree on a starting color, say yellow. Next, Alice and Bob both randomly select private colors and mix them into the public yellow in order to disguise their private color. Now, Alice keeps her private color and sends her mixture to Bob, and Bob keeps his private color and sends his mixture to Alice. 
now the heart of the trick. Alice and Bob add their private colors to the other person's mixture and arrive at a shared secret color. Notice how Eve is unable to determine this color since she needs one of the private colors to do so. And that is the trick. Now, to do this with numbers, we need a numerical procedure which is easy in one direction and hard in the reverse direction. This brings us to modular arithmetic, which is known as clock arithmetic. For example, to find 42 mod 12, we take a rope of length 46 units and wrap it around a clock of 12 units, which is called the modulus, and wherever the rope ends is the solution. So we say 42 mod 12 is congruent to 10. Easy. Now to make this work, we need a prime modulus such as 17 instead of 12. Then we find the primitive root of 17, which is a number that has no factors in common, in this case 3. And it has this important property that when raised to different exponents, the solution distributes uniformly around the clock. 3 is known as the generator. So if we raise 3 to any exponent x, the solution is equally likely to be any integer between 0 and 17. Now, the reverse procedure is hard. Say, given 12, find the exponent 3 needs to be raised to. This is called the discrete logarithm problem. And now we have our one-way function. Easy to perform, but hard to reverse. Given 12, you would have to resort to trial and error in order to find the matching exponent. How hard is this? Well, with small numbers, it's easy. But if we use a prime modulus which is hundreds of digits long, it starts to get seriously hard. Even if you had access to all the computational power on Earth, it could take thousands of years or more to find the answer. So the strength of a one-way function is based on the time needed to reverse it. Now this is our solution. First, Alice and Bob publicly agree on a prime modulus and a generator, for example, 17 and 3. Then Alice selects a private random number, say 54, and calculates 3 to the power 54 mod 17 and sends this result publicly to Bob. Then Bob selects his private random number, say 24, and calculates 3 to the power 24 mod 17 and sends this result publicly to Alice. And now the heart of the trick. Alice takes Bob's public result and raises it to the power of her private number, which gives 3 to the power 24 times 54, and she obtains the shared secret, which in this case is 1. Bob takes Alice's public result and raises it to the power of his private number, which gives 3 to the power 54 times 24, resulting in the same shared secret. Notice they did the same calculation with the exponents in a different order. 24 times 54 is the same as 54 times 24. Without one of the private numbers, Eve will not be able to find the solution. And this is how it's done. While Eve is stuck grinding away at the discrete logarithm problem, and with large enough numbers, this will literally take forever. To gain the full benefits out of PGP, or GPG, both parties must be using it. Sure, you may be able to encrypt your emails with it, but what if the recipient doesn't have GPG, much less know what encryption is? You can only bring someone to the lake, but you can't force them to jump into the water. What you can do is educate people so they are encouraged to take their own steps in safeguarding their messages. One thing you can do in this regard is use GPG for digital signatures. Digital signatures serve the function of providing authentication and data integrity. Instead of encrypting information with a public key, you encrypt information with your private key. If the information can be decrypted using your public key, then the party can know that it came from you and the information is therefore verified. So, if you wish to begin taking full advantage of GPG, you're going to need a few pieces of software. If you're on Linux, you can scratch off one of them, which is the GPG for Win, as in this demonstration, I'm using Windows. So to begin, let's go ahead and get the Mozilla Thunderbird Mail client. Go to mozilla.org, find the Thunderbird page, or just run a search query for Thunderbird. Go ahead and download the application and run the installer. Okay. 
Next, use Thunderbird as our default mail application, install it, and we can go ahead and launch Mozilla Thunderbird now. The second piece of software we will need in Windows, um, we're, gonna, we're going to need Thunderbird in Linux, so you can apt-get install Thunderbird or yum install Thunderbird. Here in Windows, you're going to need the second piece of software you'll need is GPG4Win. So go to gpg4win.org, that's gpg4win.org, or run a search query for GPG for Windows. Come to this downloads page, and I would download the GPG for Win Lite package rather than the full package, which includes a few other things like the Cleopatra GUI. Um, we're not going to use that. We've got Thunderbird, so we're all good here. So download the GPG for Win Lite package. Once that is downloaded, go ahead and run the installer. We'll hit next, 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 yes, next, install. I got that error because I already have GPG installed, so you shouldn't have to worry about anything like that. We'll hit next, check this box, next, screw rebooting. And then the third and final piece of software we will need, second if you're on Linux, is Enigmail, which is an extension for the Mozilla Thunderbird Mail client. So go to enigmail.net or run a search query for Enigmail. Go to the home page and download the latest XPI. Go ahead and save the XPI and then open up Mozilla Thunderbird. So you should be at an interface that looks similar to this. Go into the upper right hand corner to the application menu drop down and hit add-ons. Go to the extensions tab and then open up the directory where you saved the Enigma XPI and then drag and drop that into our add-ons manager window. You will be prompted to install Enigma. Do so. Then restart the client. Now that we have Enigma installed, PGP is ready to go. The last thing we need to do before we can go ahead and generate our key pair is add the email address or email account we wish to associate with this all. So go ahead and create a new account. We will skip this and use our ex existing email address. And go ahead and add in our credentials here. should resolve the IMAP and SMTP right here. We'll hit done, it will verify our password, and if everything worked out in the left sidebar over here, you will see your email account, and when we go to the inbox, it should fetch your messages. And there we are. So the next thing to do after we have our email account added to Thunderbird is go up to our applications menu dropdown, go to our new open PGP option right here, and go to setup wizard. We will hit yes, next. Yes, we wish to sign all of our emails, so regardless if the recipient is using GPG or not, they will see that we have digitally signed our email. No, we will create per recipient rules. And then we will select yes right here, because if we do not, we would have to specify manually um, some of these options. So we'll just hit yes right there, we'll hit next. And what we want to do now is create a new key pair. Next. Now, just as with TrueCrypt, we want to specify a passphrase that is rather long and definitely randomized. So if you think a 24 character pat or whatever, 24 character password is long, but it cons it consists of multiple basic words from a dictionary. Dog, cat, alpha, beta, theta, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, exclamation point. That may seem lengthy but I don't know if it's strong and it is arguably just as vulnerable as a shorter eight character password. So with that said, I would recommend again using a randomized alphanumeric grid or some sort of pattern that you can easily remember a lengthy alphanumeric password with some symbols in there. So go ahead and do that now. I'm just using something shorter after my spiel right there um, just for convenience. And then we'll hit next twice and start moving our cursor around randomly, speed this process up. And what we'll do next is generate our 
revocation certificate, and a revocation certificate is applicable in the instance that an attacker intercepts one of our keys. If they intercept this, then they will be able to impersonate us, especially against other users who have our pub keys. So in that instance, we would want to revoke our key. And we can only do this with our certificate. So you're going to save that certificate, verify your password right here, and then transfer, the, get that off your computer, throw that onto some sort of external source, a hard, external hard drive, a CD-ROM, what have you. And so we are now ready to go ahead and send over our pub key to our friend. So we'll go to open PGP right here, key management. Um, you should be, the interface should look blank like this. You check this box, display all keys by default. Right click on your email address and export keys to file. Now you will export the public key save it and you would transfer that to your recipients who are using GBG with you just going to send it um, via email person two so I'm sending my pub key to my buddy who is using GPG right attachment we'll hit send okay and now my friend should be receiving my attachment rather shortly let's go see what my friend is up to my friend just got a new email. My friend checks it. My friend is well aware that we are going to be using GPG. They already followed the same setup prior to what we've done so far. And your friend, our friend, opens up the attachment, double clicks on it within this interface, and are prompted to import the pub key. So we're going to hit import. And we'll get the open PGP alert. The key was successfully imported. So now that our friend has our pub key, it's time for them to send us their pub key. So your friend would have already done this. They would have already opened PGP to key, or not to key management, to the setup. So your friend would have created a key pair of their own at no time sharing the password, the private keys for yourself. Move my cursor around. This isn't a VM, so this may take a little longer. Um, we'll skip generating this revocation certificate, but it's very important. And we'll hit finish, and then so your friend would go ahead to their key management and they would send you theirs so so um, your friend would send us their pub key so person one And I just received my friend's email. So, oh cool, got my friend's pub key. Click on that, should be prompted to import it. We will import it, and that is successful. So the next thing to do is go ahead and go to our application menu, into our key management. And now we should see our key and our friend's key. We want to go over to our friend's key that we just received and imported, right click on it, go down to key properties, go down to select action, and you're going to want to set the owner trust to ultimate. Hit close and exit out of here. Your friend would do the same thing. They received your pub key, person one. They would set the owner trust to ultimate. Now the last step before we begin sending encrypted messages is to specify the pub key with the recipient. To do this, we go up to our address book, collected addresses, 
And there's my friend right there who I earlier sent my pub key attachment to. So I'm going to go ahead, right click on them, create open PGP rule for my dress. Right down here, use the following open PGP keys. You should have nothing in here right now. Go ahead to select key. Um, if this is red right here, go ahead and refresh the key list and that is no longer red. And it may in fact automatically select that for you, but if it's not automatically selected, go ahead and check the box that is right next to your friend's email address. That is their pub key that they sent to you and you use their pub key when you are sending them an encrypted message. So go ahead and hit OK with that. Your friend would equally do the same thing. Address book. Create open PGP rules, select key, and they would select person one. Go ahead and do that. So now we are ready to begin exchanging encrypted contents. So I would go up here to write as I normally send an email, a Mozilla Mozilla Thunderbird, type in my friend's email address. Hello, this is some secure contents boy. And then we'll go up here to our open PGP button. Make sure encrypt message is checked because when you're sending emails, not everybody is using GPG. They don't need to use GPG to see that you signed your message, but they need GPG to be able to decrypt the contents. So let's go ahead and hit send. Type in the password to your private key. And as you can see that just sent out in ciphertext, our friend should have received that. And now they are prompted to enter in their private key. They don't know my password. They only know their password that they used when generating their key pair. So they enter in that password. And as you can see, decrypted and you can now read the plain text nice and clear. Let's go ahead and reply to this. Go ahead and hit send. And that should have sent over to me. Yep, I just received that. And now I enter in my private key. My passphrase that we used in generating that key pair. Thank you kindly, good sir. And so if we were to go online here to Gmail, we'll go ahead and log in to either or. I will just go person one. Now, if we open this up, you see it's not the plain text. It's definitely the cipher text right here. So if a warrant was signed to seize my Gmail account, they pop in here. What do you know? Bunch of gibberish. Former National Security Agency contractor Edward Snowden has accused the U.S. of hacking into Chinese mobile phone companies and Tsinghua University. The journalist who broke the surveillance story, Glenn Greenwald, confirms to NBC News that Snowden has shared encrypted copies of all the classified documents he collected with contacts around the globe so that the documents won't disappear even if he does. We are just not buying that this was a technical decision by a Hong Kong immigration official. This was a deliberate choice by the government to release a fugitive despite a valid arrest warrant and that decision unquestionably has a negative impact on the US-China relationship. Therefore any accusations aimed at Russia are nothing more than utter nonsense. He is a transit passenger and as such is located in the transit area. Our special services have never interacted with Mr. Snowden before and they do not do it today. As for the possibility of extradition, we can only hand over foreign state nationals to those states that we have a relevant, valid international agreement on the extradition of criminals. 
We do not have any such treaties signed with the United States. There is another person in a similar situation, that's Mr Assange, who is demanded for extradition and called a criminal, just like Mr Snowden. He considers himself a human rights activist and fights for the freedom of information. In your eyes, is Snowden a criminal, a whistleblower, a leaker? So the question is, is Edward Snowden a hero or is he a traitor? So in your opinion, is Snowden a hero or a traitor? Is Edward Snowden a hero or a traitor? Is Snowden a hero or a traitor? Well, hack or hero? In that regard, you called Mr. Snowden. You said he committed treason. That's correct. I would describe this man as an American hero. Well, I don't want to go into this right now. I want to get him uh, caught. And for somebody to tell the American people the truth, is a heroic effort. I think he's a traitor. For Edward Snowden is a hero. He's arguably a traitor. Uh, I would lend, tend more toward hero, but, uh, you know, he's a whistleblower hero, I think, more than a criminal. And who cares if he uh, violated his employment agreement? His first oath when he was uh, served our country is to defend the Constitution of the United States from enemies foreign and domestic. It's created a boom in the downloading of equipment, for example, code encryption equipment. And now the chance is you can encrypt your phone calls and your emails to stay private and personal away from the NSA.